session with Professor Ernest Tucker, who will give us an in-depth look at the reign of Nader Shah mm. and his break with tradition and reimagining re of Iran and the relationship between the Shah and Shah and other rulers. Our second panelist, Janet O'Brien, will approach the Nader Shah's reign from the perspective of royal portraiture and what light that sheds on the notion of the king's authority. And our final panelist is Kianush Motagaidi, who also pursues a topic of art, looking at its use as a medium for displaying royal themes in the Qajar period. So beginning with Professor Tucker, he is at the US Naval Academy where he's been teaching history since 1990. Um, he's published three books on Iran and the Ottoman Empire. And his articles have appeared in a wide variety of scholarly journals, dictionaries and encyclopedias. He's consulted for a variety of governmental and non-governmental organizations. And he's traveled extensively in the Middle East and led several student groups to the region, including one of midshipmen to Israel in 1992 and another of American undergraduates to Syria in 1998. Professor Tucker's current research focus is the history of early modern Iran and the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire as a window on the complex situations faced by Muslim societies in the early modern world. And most recently, he's written a chapter in a forthcoming Routledge volume, The Safavid World, on Safavid Iran's relations with other Muslim empires and rulers. So moving now to Janet, Janet O'Brien is at the Courtauld Institute of Art, University of London, and she's in her final year as a doctoral student and the recipient of the Sudhavar Memorial Foundation grant. Janet is the current Smithsonian Institution pre-doctoral fellow at the Freer Gallery of Art and Arthur M. Sackler Gallery in Washington. She previously served in curatorial positions at the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore and the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston. And she's a contributing author of Bestowing Beauty, Masterpieces from Persian Lands, Selections from the Hossein Afshar Collection. This was in 2020. Now, uh, Kianush Motagedi is an artist and Islamic art historian. His publications include books and articles in the fields of Persian ceramics, Calligraphy, calligraphy and Kaja Arts, and he was awarded in scholarships in both 2017 and 2018 from the French Ministry of Culture and Communication for his research. Projects that Kianus has worked on include L'Empire des Roses, exhibition at the Louvre Long Art Museum in 2018, and his most recent research in the field is the study of royal wall, wall painting and rock reliefs from the Kaja period. So I will, just before I hand over to um, Professor Tucker, I just want to remind, I'll be sending notes to speakers at reminding you of timing towards the end of your, um, of your, of your lecture. And um, just to remind people that they need to write their questions and please put your name, but also which speaker you're addressing your question too. I'm sure it will be obvious, but it just makes it easier to um, sift um, through them. And I'll do my best to make sure as many as possible get answered. Um, so, um, Ernest Tucker, can I please hand over to you now to start yes. the panel? Yes, and Sarah, thank you so much for uh, your sponsorship of this wonderful conference and to Charles Melville and to the Sudavar Foundation as well. Uh, my, my great thanks to all of you. Um, I also wanted to give my paper uh, in memory of Michael Axworthy, who Charles had mentioned, but he was a great friend of mine and a great scholar of 18th century Iran and uh, all things Iranian. So again, a kind of a salute to him. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about uh, an idea of Iran, and in this case, the idea of Iran of, of Nader, Nader Shah. Uh, Nader Shah's reign, of course, despite his relatively short time on the Iranian throne in the 1730s and 40s, had a definite impact on ideas of Iran. They evolved from late Safavid times 
through the early Qajar period that we've been hearing about already. His path to power prompted him to depart quite radically from concepts of Iran developed under the Safavids. Visions of Iran in the Safavid Haiti, of course, fused traditions and tropes from a rediscovered pre-Islamic Persian past with the legacy of the Turkmen nomadic heritage, all against the backdrop of a rapidly evolving early modern 12 Rishi Iranian religious identity. These diverse parts of Safavid identity helped frame an image of Safavid Iran, often now seen as the precursor of more modern visions of the nation. By late Safavid times, any idea of Iran had come to include powerful but distinct spheres of religious and secular identity. Both were supposed, supported by the dynasty's far, our royal reputation, that endured long after its material collapse at the hands of the insurgent Hotiki Afghan horsemen in October 1722. Nader's meteoric rise from obscurity in the 1720s, his seizure of power and erasure of the vestiges of Safavid authority in the 1730s, the defeat of the Mughals at Karnal just north of Delhi in 1739, and continuing challenge to the Ottomans for control of Iraq and the Caucasus in the 1740s gave him the opportunity to reimagine Iran considerably. The evolution of his own idea of Iran appears through the evidence of contemporary chronicles and sources as his attempt to create an invented tradition, to borrow a term familiar from other historiographies of the early modern world. His chroniclers ultimately portrayed his project as the rebuilding of a Timurid style world empire in which Iran would shine as the jewel in the crown of a united Ummah with distinctive Persianate, Turco-Mongol, and Islamicate aspects. In this system, other Islamic rulers, specifically the Mughals and the Uzbeks, were to become subsidiary shahs under Nader as Shahan Shah, a concept harking back both to the pre-Islamic Persian practice as well as to the Turco-Mongol tradition of steppe governance. Overlaid on this was the vision of a reunited Muslim Ummah with 12 Shiism brought back into the fold as a fifth madhab, or right of Sunni Islam. Such an invention of tradition seems designed to get beyond the long period of sectarian discord that had accompanied Safavid rule. The Ottomans played important roles in both these components of Nader's new idea of Iran. In the Turco-Mongol tribal context, presumed Ottoman lineage ties to Nader were construed as familial, with Nader framed as the younger brother to the Ottoman Sultan as the older brother of common Turkic or Turkmen ancestry. In the religious context, Nader offered to recognize the Ottoman ruler's status as guardian of Mecca and Medina, as well as his general role as leader of the Sunni world, in return for official Ottoman approval of Nader's reimagined version of Shiism as a more integral part of the Sunni world. These various parts of Nader's new idea of Iran sought thus to transcend the limitations of the Safavid idea of Iran. Ultimately, of course, Nader's project was quite short-lived given his brief but tumultuous 11 years as monarch. Nader's reign has been depicted as principally a time of brutal tyranny whose impact on Iran and the region was defined by what he destroyed and ruined or as a moment when a powerful ruler, however flawed and cruel, took control in a way that definitely marked Iran's entrance into the early modern world. Nader's attempts to invent a new idea of Iran, even if transitory, had several enduring legacies. His time on the throne greatly widened a divide between uh, royal and religious authority in Iran that had begun under the Safids and continued into Qajar times. Nader's conclusion of the 1746 Kurdan peace treaty with the Ottomans also paradoxically created a space for Iran in an Islamic community of nations that presaged Iran's place in the modern world. An examination of the phases in this evolution of Nader's idea of Iran, even if never really implemented, may add depth to our overall understanding of the long-term historical impacts of his rule. Nader's story in all of its aspects took place in the period of Safavid demise. So it might be useful to begin with the idea of Iran at that time. 
it is no secret, and other panelists have commented on this, that Safavid identity had been shaped from the dynasty's beginning through its support for and connections to Twelver Shiism. Seen early on in Shah Ismail's well-known allusions in mystical Turkish poetry of his descent from the seventh Shi Imam Musa al-Qasim. As Safavid Shi identities evolved through the 16th and 17th centuries, Iran grew into a great center of Shi'i learning, forging strong ties to Shi'i communities and scholars around the Muslim world, particularly in India, Lebanon, and Iraq. The Safavid era's embrace of older Persianate forms of literary and poetic traditions embodied in their new versions of the Shahnameh, which we've talked about a little bit later versions of that, and other classic poems completed and deepened this period's idea of Iran as well. These literary excursions were in turn uniquely augmented by the creativity of other genre of Safavid intellectual achievement, epitomized by works produced by the philosophers, for example, of the school of Isfahan. All of this fell into sudden turmoil with the arrival of the Hotiki Afghans and the collapse of the Safavid dispensation in 1722. These staunch, staunchly Sunni horsemen must have been quite perplexed by their sudden capture of the Iranian heartland, a situation that ultimately only lasted a few years. Their conquest certainly did not allow the Afghans really enough time to forge any meaningful idea of Iran to displace the earlier version kept alive, as has been noted by various Safavid pretenders and claimants appearing through the 1720s and 1730s. Uncertainty about the idea of Iran thus hovered over the country just as Nader first rose to prominence, a situation that might have given him more room for his own innovative ideas to develop as he proceeded to rise in importance as a military leader. One of Nader's earliest military achievements in his native Khorasan was to defeat one of the area's main warlords, Malik Mahmoud Sistani in 1726. Sistani had begun to construct his own novel idea of Iran with sovereignty being justified by claimed descent from an eclectic mix of ancient royal families such as the Kayanids, as well as later Islamic dynasties such as the Safarids. Nader made his own first name, made, made his, name, his own name first as a loyal commander in the struggle to restore the Safavid order. He became one of Safavid Shah Tahmas II's main commanders in campaigns against invading Afghan and Ottoman armies. Gaining an initial reputation for military competence in Tahmas service, Nader's own continuous string of victories, together with a growing perception of Tahmas weakness, persuaded him soon to oust Tahmas, as we know, and installed his infant son as a figurehead given the regnal name Abbas the third. Um, one of the major chronicles of Nader, the Tariq al Amaraya Nadri of Muhammad Qasim Marvi, foreshadows the emergence of Nader's own idea of Iran in his account of how Nader replaced Tahmas with Abbas. On the whole, Marvi's work reveals him to have supported the Safavids as Iran's legitimate rulers. Marvi's work shows that he first saw Nader as the Safavids' worthy champion, but then uh, as doomed after he usurped them, no matter what his military prowess might have been. In Marvi's version of Abbas's accession, uh, he has Abbas begin to cry when he receives the crown. Marvi reports that Nader told his followers that by crying, Abbas was indicating that he, quote, wanted to rule over the Afghans of Kandahar and the Ottoman Sultan. Marvi then had to affirm, as Abbas requested, I will throw reins around the necks of the Ottoman Sultan, Hussein Shah Afghan, Muhammad Shah of India, and Abul Faiz Khan, ruler of Turan, and make them serve his magnificent court. I will have prayers recited and strike coins in the name of this sovereign Safavid prince. Although Marvi's work reveals a clear pro Safavid slant here, his account also foreshadows the development of Nader's own idea of Iran. Marvi has Nader articulated an idea of Iran that dominated the Ottomans, Afghans, Mughals, and Uzbeks, figurative center of an Ummah governed by empires linked through Turco-Mongol lineage ties. To tie this more closely to Nader's legitimacy as a ruler, Marvi and other contemporary chroniclers also record how Nader tried to make connections with the legacy of Timur, the epitome of a Turco-Mongol Islamic ruler whom he sought to emulate through his career. Um, Nader's striking coronation ceremony in the plains of Mugan in the spring of 1736 formed the true beginning 
of the evolution of his idea of Iran. This coronation was designed to allow him to decouple royal legitimacy in Iran from claims of imami lineage, our support for the particularities of Shiism as a way to distinguish Iran from its neighbors. It was also an effort to, again, invent tradition by assembling, in this case, a Kuriltai gathering in imitation of a venerable Turco-Mongol ruling tradition. At this occasion, Nader called for integrating Shiism into Sunni Islam as a, as a fifth right or mazhab to enjoy the same status as the conventional four Sunni legal schools. He proposed that 12-er Shiism be redefined as the mazhab Jafari in recognition of the importance of Jafar al-Sadaq, the sixth imam. Shi differences from the various Sunni legal schools would henceforth be treated as minor divergencies, just as differences between other legal schools had been tolerated for centuries. This new idea of Iran unveiled at Mughan departed from Safavid tradition in many ways. In religious terms, it drew in a basic appeal to the commonalities of the Ummah to argue for the equal status of all Muslims. Such a reimagining of Shiism would have nullified the classic Ottoman justification for war against the Safavids as heretics. It would also have provided Iran's ruler a more legitimate status in connection with activities tied to pilgrimages to Mecca and Medina and to various sites in Iraq, specifically the control of the annual Hajj caravan with its tax and trade revenue potential. To symbolize this unity, Nader introduced a new cap with four folds, the Kolahe Nadri. Its symbolism has variously been interpreted as alluding to the four rightly guided caliphs, which is one interpretation, in place of the 12 red pleats of the headgear designed to honor the 12 imams, are of the Kizilbash, are as a visual reminder of the four great contemporary Muslim domains, Iran, the Ottoman Empire, the Uzbek Empire, and the Mughal Empire. This Kurultai also invoked the steppe tradition of approving a new tribal leader through a conclave of elders who recognized him in the ceremony. At Nader's uh, Kurultai, it was not only an assemblage of the representatives of the ruling nomadic class, though, the warrior class of the tribal, Turkic tribal groups, um, but delegations from all communities under his rule, sedentary, nomadic, Muslim, and non-Muslim. Such a gathering also offered, in addition to how it recalled Turco-Mongol tradition, a distant echo of pre-Islamic Persian tradition of simultaneous rulership that Mike, Michael Axworthy had talked about in his books over a vast panoply of subjects reflected so famously at Persepolis. Nader presented this proposed juxtaposition of religious and cultural identities in an embassy dispatched to the Ottomans a few months after Mughan in 1736. Seeking Sultan Mahmud I's acknowledgement of Nader's accession to the throne, the Iranian ambassador described the religious component of Nader's new ideas. He called uh, on the Ottoman ruler in his capacity uh, as servitor at the two holy places, the Hadam al Hadamin and Sharifain, to erect a new pillar at the Kaaba, commemorating the Jafri rite and providing proof of its equal status with other rites at this principal meeting ground of the Islamic Ummah. Uh, Nader's emissary also invoked the Turco-Mongol tradition, talking about Nader's membership in the Ile Jalile Turkman, okay. Uh, later Iranian uh, documents reused this phrase repeatedly as a reminder of his broad lineage connections to the Ottomans, Mughals, and Central Asian rulers. Okay. Um, Raghab, uh, the Ottoman uh, participant in this, in this uh, embassy, uh, noted that the first letter he wrote uh, Nader had written to him was not written in Persian, in fact, but in Iranian Turkish, Iran Turkisi. Uh, Nader stated in it that in the time of Chinggis Khan, the leaders of the Turkmen tribes who left the land of Turan and migrated to Iran and Anatolia were said to all be of one stock and one lineage. At that time, the exalted ancestor of the dynasty, uh, the Ottoman Sultan, the Ottoman uh, you know, antecedents, headed to Anatolia, and our ancestors settled in the provinces of Iran. Since these lineages are interwoven and connected, it is hoped that when the Sultan learns of this, he will give royal consent to the establishment of peace. Okay, so uh, Nader even held out in negotiations, or his emissary held out in negotiations with the Ottomans that he might even uh, entertain being considered a special vassal along the lines of the Crimean Khan, and that's a whole other story. But in any case, uh, the Ottomans were unimpressed after several days of talks with his new idea. Um, I think it would be anachronistic and misleading to read this invocation of Turkish blood ties now as some sort of proto-pan-Turkism, though. 
1736 articulations of Nutter's idea of Iran were sort of rough drafts of concepts that he refined over the next 11 years of his reign. Um, the fullest articulation of his religious idea took place in Najaf uh, in Iraq in 1743. And the political reformulations uh, took shape after his defeat of the Mughals and the rulers of Central Asia. Um, continued Ottoman skepticism about Nader's concept reflect how much reflected how much Ottoman desires to resurrect the Safavid idea of Iran, at least in the way the Ottomans construed this, drove Ottoman policy in Iran for decades after the fall of Isfahan. They pursued this either by intermittently promoting Safavid pretenders to the Iranian throne or securing peace with Nader at various times, it, 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 with at all possible to restore the Safavid status quo ante. Ottoman persistence testifies to their enduring nostalgia for the, for the time of the Safavids, which is interesting. Everyone uh, so far in this conference seems to have nostalgia for the Safavids. <laughs> so that's a common theme despite all the differences. In the end, Nader became compelled to accept the broad parameters of the Ottoman vision when he signed the Treaty of Kurdan, as we'll mention uh, in a couple of minutes. So uh, the, 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 the idea of Iran, Nader's idea of Iran and the conquest of India. Um, the impact of his conquest of India on his idea of Iran can be seen in these uh, contemporary documents. After the Battle of Karnal, where he defeated the Mughals, his letters began describing him as Shahin Shah over the Mughal Emperor Nasruddin Muhammad, whose title now became Shah Muhammad, following his restoration of sovereignty. Uh, Nader treated the Uzbek ruler, ruler Abul Fayez Khan in a very similar fashion, renaming him Abul Fayez uh, Shah, which sounds strange in the Central Asian context, but that was the idea, to establish a symmetry uh, with the Mughals. Um, and, and all these different uh, things continue to emerge after the, um, the, the, the conquest of India. Okay. Um, the other piece that, that becomes really obvious here is Nutter's attempt to associate himself with the Far, or the royal reputation of Timur and his descendants. This theme present in so many of the contemporary chronicles of Nader and in his own court documents came into special focus upon his victory over the Mughals, depicted as parallel with Timur's own victories in India. Nader took pains to recognize the Mughal ruler's status as legitimate based on the Mughals' Timurid ancestry. Um, and th then all this, this connection just gets more and more emphasized. Um, okay. Um, and uh, of course, uh, his, his court chronicler, uh, after glossing over the devastation caused by the infamous Delhi massacre, immediately shifts to recounting an event designed to increase happiness, the marriage of a Mughal princess to Nader's son, Nasrullah. The other major contemporary chronicler, Marvi's description of this marriage also provides an occasion for him to discuss Nader's, the Turkman concept I mentioned before. Uh, Marvi, the chronicler Marvi has Nader proclaim, since the exalted lineage of the imperial deputy, uh, meaning Nader, is Turkman, and the Mughal Padishah, who is the wellspring of eloquence, is also Turkman, there is no separation between them. Um, Although there was an awareness of general ethnic ties between Timur and the Turkmans as members of the, such Turkmans as members of the Afshar tribe, such a bold assertion of kinship in an official document constituted an invention of tradition even more substantial than the links earlier adduced between Nader and the Ottomans. Okay, and then we get into the discussion at, at Najaf, where the clearest presentation of his religious proposals took place in late 1743 at the Iraqi shrine city there in a conclave between Iranian, Ottoman and Central Asian ulema. Um, and he was, uh, one of the witnesses there was a guy named Abdullah Suwadi who presented his view of Nader's ideas from the perspective of a Sunni religious official in the Ottoman Empire. Um, it's of course very revealing that uh, the Iranian spokesman at Najaf used the arguments to justify Nader's new concepts similar to ones employed uh, by the Iranian ambassador to the Ottomans in 1736. Nader simply wanted the Ottomans to accept legally and officially that Iranian Muslims could be considered Sunni without any discussion of theological intricacies. Um, 
As a result, Asawadi and the other participants in the council signed a document at the conclusion of the meeting that hardly mentioned any reconceiving of 12 Shiism as the Jaffrey Masthab, focused on the confirmation of mutually held principles of Islam. Okay, Asawadi closes his account of this meeting uh, with a strong feeling that the entire gathering felt like nothing more than an exercise in tahiyyah or taqiyya, the ritual dissimulation. Uh, perhaps creative use of tahiyyeh might be one way for, uh, you know, devout Iranian Shi clerics to manage their own acceptance of Nader's proposal. Asawaita's invocation of tahiyyeh might help explain how Nader proposed to avoid exploration of the more problematic aspects of his new religious ideas in either domestic or foreign context. This Ottoman account confirms the persistence and intensification, though, after the conquest of Iran, of Nader's campaign to get the Ottomans to accept the new idea of Iran he had been pushing since 1736. Um, uh, Suedi basically suggests that by 1743, uh, Nader had extended his concept of political legitimation uh, based on his success in the East, in India. Um, the end of conflict uh, between Nader and the Ottomans came kind of quietly. Uh, both sides were depleted and exhausted by 1745. Nader finally sent peace proposals in which previous demands uh, about the Jafri Mastab were admitted. As his grip on Iran weakened in 1746 with revolts springing up around his realm, he became more willing to accept Ottoman terms for lasting peace settlement. Uh, he finally signed the Treaty of Cardan, which essentially was a restatement of the 1639 Treaty of Zohab. It restored the borders of that time and was an important guarantee to the, to the good treatment of Iranians making the Hajj pilgrimage or going to the Atabat uh, shrine cities of Iraq. This treaty signaled the end of conflict between the Ottomans and Iranians and cleared the way for the Ottomans to recognize Nader. Okay. Um, and then there's a, you know, we can we can go on and, and discuss all the, the 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 intricacies of the treaty. But the point is, it was a, a a treaty to protect Iranians based on recognition of their of their common Islamic uh, background with the Ottomans. Okay, so um, where did this leave us? Um, basically. Uh, Nader's diplomatic achievement was soon followed by the total disintegration of his regime. So that was a problem. Uh, this in turn became part of the general upheaval uh, uh, across the Muslim Ummah uh, during the 18th century with the greater and greater involvement of European powers. Nader's idea of Iran, despite its failure to take root, did not did set the stage for more modern ideas to take shape beginning in Qajar times, as we've seen already in some of the panels before. The questions it raised too about the nature of relationships across the sectarian divides of the Muslim Ummah, as well as its attempts through an invention of tradition to redefine relationships between Iran and the empires around it are issues that continue to confront Iran over the next few centuries as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, that was, that was a, a fabulous talk and a great introduction to um, our second panel. Now, um, at the moment, um, the questions are open, but I don't seem to have anything there yet. Um, perhaps while I, um, while we wait and see if any come in, which I'm sure they will, um, I just wanted to ask you, I was kind of, picking up things as you, as you went along, which, which resonated a little bit, uh -huh. um, although I'm absolutely no expert on the Qajar period myself, but you talked about harking back to pre-Islamic um, Iran, and um, you mentioned, well, obviously there's the image of the Shah and Shah, but then you also mentioned his, um, Nada's um, uh, association, associating himself with the, with the Far, and mm -hmm. I wondered if you could say anything about that or about the sort of symbolism and obviously that he wasn't associating it with the pre-Islamic past, was he? He was just going back as far as either right. Timurid or Safavid, I don't know. Well, I think it's all kind of mixed together in a way. You know, it's this it's this uh, freestanding fire that is kind of floating out there, it, it, ready for the great warrior to to, to, to grasp. And I think it's important that you mention the fire because it's a way for Nader to get around 
the problem of him being descended from very uh, ordinary uh, warriors north of Meshhead. <laughs> That's where he's from, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But the fire is kind of this, this, this light that can come down to him. And the idea is that it came down to him in the same way that it came down to Timur. And that Timur, there are all kinds of legends, and I've written articles about this, talking about his, his, his connections to magical meetings and dreams of Timur and, and this, the Kalate Nadri, his son Babi had done such wonderful work on the on Nader's shrine place that he tried to create in the Kalate Nadri, which was designed to somehow be a follow-on to Timur. So, so the Far, I think, is very much an Islamic Far that is connected with a, maybe a Timurid Far, if we could even say that, but, but certainly with many, many connections to the pre-Islamic world too. You know, not maybe so specific, but you know, a lot of names and connections and places that are, that are enshrined as, with the others too, so yeah. Thank you, thank you so much. Now I reminded and reminded myself that actually we're waiting till the end um, to take the questions, um, but that's really interesting and yeah. um, I'm sure people are saving up to the end. So we'll move now to Janet. In fact, we're, we are right on time because you finished a tiny bit early. So now, um, thank you and over to Janet O'Brien. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Charles, for organizing the event. And I'm sorry about the light on my face. I've timed it really well so that it hits right in the middle of my face. I apologize. Um, but um, I would also like, of course, to thank the Sudafan Memorial Foundation for allowing me to participate in this symposium among more learned and esteemed scholars and it's hard act to follow Professor Tucker being the authority uh, in Nordic Shah's history. And also, um, uh, and also just to say um, thank you for the, um, the Memorial Foundation for um, generously supporting my research together with other funders. So if I may um, go to now share my screen. Um, I hope you can see that. Okay. Um, Sarah, can you see that? Because actually I can't see myself. I can't see your screen, oh, Janet. Yes. Yes, um, no, that's perfect. Yeah. That's better. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, two months ago, I stumbled upon this print of the motherland figure leaning on Reza Shah of the Pahlavi dynasty. It was made for the Parsi community in Bombay in 1924 a time when Reza Khan, as he was then known, was actively seeking their support for his nationalist project and encouraging their repatriation. Loaded with evocation and rhetoric, this image deserves a, um, a deeper unpacking, which I plan to do at a later point. What intrigues me most, however, is the appearance of Nadi Shah in the top right corner, and this image is modeled on an oil painting in Tehran, and I'm showing you a detailed view in the bottom right. Parsis derived their Zoroastrian identity from ancient Iran and representations of Cyrus, Darius and Shapur are expected. And um, there's Cyrus and then there's Darius and Shapur. But why is Nadi Shah here, the only ruler from the Islamic period? Like the ancient greats, Nadi was celebrated for his vast empire and his conquest of India would have been a source of pride for the Parsis. He was also said to be a great hero to Reza Shah. His self-styling as Iran's savior further played into Pahlavi's brand of nationalism, which explains his instructions to Reza Shah, um, which I've typed up on the right and translated, to protect motherland against the enemy of Iran. What this print also demonstrates, and what's pertinent for this talk, is the powerful resonance of Nordi's image almost two centuries after his rule, Thanks to his many portraits, the extent of which had never been seen before him, Nordi's instantly recognizable image has become a symbol of Iran's victory and imperial glory, and in this case, a constituent part of the idea of Iran for Reza Shah and the Parsis. The extraordinary lasting power of Nordi's image to the present day is attested by its many iterations across a range of media. He is recreated in the flesh, in theatres, heroicized, 
in a bronze sculpture animated in children's books and cartoons, and he battles on in the virtual world of video games. The resemblance to the early portraits of Nodde is a testament to a three century long visual lineage. Yet, with the exception of Leila Dibor, Abuela Sudufa, and Adele Adamova, authors of Persian painting texts have paid little attention to Nodde and dismissed the turbulent um, Afsharic period as an era of artistic darkness. The visual legacy of Nodde began with a number of portraits created after his Delhi conquest of 1739, some during his reign and others not long after his death in 1747. I should discuss some of them in just a moment, but viewing them side by side here allows us to observe that, despite the different settings, styles and media, a very specific iconography of Nodde has emerged. They share a remarkable consistency, not only in terms of his four-pointed hat and jewels looted from Delhi, but also his proud-chested, arms akimbo swagger, his unflinching gaze and resolute look, his face turned towards the right to show off his jenge, which is the feather egret one on the right to signal his sovereign status, and his head slightly tilted back to give an air of pride and awe that befits a conqueror. It is this depiction from his early portraits that has endured to the present day the image that has come to be recognized as Nodde. The legend of Nodde began with his meteoric ascent from a tribal soldier to Khorasan, uh, from Khorasan uh, to the commander in chief of, Tam of Tamops II, and eventually depos deposing the puppet Shah Abbas III to found the Afshar dynasty in 1736. His conquest follow, um, formed an empire from the Caucasus to India and earned him admirers among great conquerors, including Napoleon and the Duke of Wellington. Nodi's invasion and plundering of India generated a frenzy of reports from St. Petersburg to Istanbul in the London newspaper and propelled him into global infamy. Armed with a war chest overflowing with the riches of India, his next target was the Ottomans. And here are two engravings published in London very shortly after the Indian conquest, showing Nodi bursting onto the stage and threatening the Ottoman Sultan. And it was also speculated that he planned to expand his empire as far west as Europe and as far east as China. Such radical change in the political landscape of Iran motivated a makeover of the royal image, chief of which is the de deployment of portraiture. My thesis investigates why Nordi's portraits were novel, were novel, specifically how they decoupled the Shah from the collective ruling body and how that visual breakup is linked to contrasting notions of rule between Nordi's self-referential brand of authority and the dynastic institution of the self of it. It's not feasible in the short paper to introduce the full corpus of Nordi's images. Instead, I shall focus on his single portraits created in Iran and how they embody his personality-driven and self-reliant image. I begin with this life-size um, oil portrait from Iran circa 1740, now at the V&A. It's the earliest extant monumental portrait of an Iranian ruler, and I'm showing you here on the right the scale um, and, and how, how monumental and unusual um, uh, it was at his, at his time. Leila Dibor has attributed it to the painter Muhammad Rizoye Hendi, who was active in Iran and India in the mid 18th century, and his works comprise royal portraits from the Asharid and Mughal courts. While there's no information to ascertain if this was ordered by Nodi himself, the meticulous rendering of luxury royal objects from the birds on the enameled hilts of the dagger and the sword, the kundan designs of the jeweled items, to the gold and silver thread in the carpet, um, and the double twisted. Um, double twists of the prayer beads as they rest on the carpet, suggest it, that it was likely a royal commission and Nodi might have even set for it. We know from textual records that he ordered multiple paintings of himself after the Delhi conquest. As for his intended function, again, we have no information, but Iran had a very long tradition of figurative war, uh, war painting. Also, according to travelers' accounts, Nodi's palaces in Esfahan, Mashhad, Gasvin, and Beshar were decorated with figurative paintings, and traces remain um, in Gathre Khoshid, 
or sun palace in Calat. One could picture this portrait adorning one of his palaces and its triumphal message would have made it a fitting choice for an audience hall. Indeed, this portrait is perhaps the most pronounced visual representation of Nodi's Indian uh, victory, the event that made him, in the words of the contemporary English writer Jonas Hanway, the most powerful of all the monarchs of the East. Nodi is depicted in the conventional kingly pose that lends him a regal bearing, and he wears the four-pointed hat he created to signify his new dynasty. But unlike representations of other Iranian rulers, Nodi is draped in looted jewels from Delhi, seated on a Mughal carpet in a Mughal tent. Bearing the fruits of his conquest, Nodi's body functions as a resplendent monument of his triumph in India. The deployment of the king's body in Persian painting as the single site of power was a trend that emerged under Nodi. In this portrait, his body dominates the tight space and commands our full attention. His stocky torso, wide girth, and bulky thighs exude masculine strength and robustness. His masculinity is further amplified by his strong and well-defined face and a full, perfectly groomed beard. The present portrait closely resembles eyewitness descriptions of his imposing presence and manly appearance and would have been readily recognized by those who had met him. But more significant is the focus on his body and what that means. An Islamic thought, bodily perfection of the king is indexical of the health of the body politic. And there are ample examples in primary sources of Nodi's physical vigor, self-discipline, and ability to endure hardship among his soldiers. In the VNA portrait, and in others such as the one on the right, Nodi, who was in his early 50s, is depicted in the fullness of health and metaphorically in command of his political body. His vitality, strength, and manliness are core attributes of Javon Nadi, which literally means young man. It's a Persian concept that encompasses the ideal qualities of a warrior and is associated with invincible heroes such as Rustam, national defender in the Shah Nameh, and Ali, warrior par excellence of Islam. Nadi's perfect and powerful body also evokes the Islam, Islamic notion of Ansani Kormel, the perfect man who is a manifestation of God. Not his physical strength, visualized through the solidity of his painted body, is in marked contrast to the more flatly rendered bodies of Safavid Shahs. The slender frames of Safavid rulers may be associated with the articulation of the legitimacy which was dependent more on the role as the head of the royal household and ruling corporation and less on their battle-tested prowess. And this is borne out pictorially by the dominance of audience scenes over battle scenes in Safavid representation. For Nore, a warrior king whose legitimacy rested on his persona as a victor and protector of India, of Iran rather, he needed to project a visually powerful body and his heavily built figure bears more resemblance to the ideal male body type in Iran and India, his conquered land, where a firm-waisted or kamaband body was a marker of battle readiness and manliness. Also in India, unlike Iran, portraiture had long been a primary mode of representing kingship and the production of royal portraits was undergoing a revival under the reigning uh, Mughal emperor Muhammad Shah. The painter of this oil portrait in the VNA, Muhammad Reza Yehendi, was a portraitist himself, active in both Iran and India. Some of Nodi's portraits were also painted by Indian court artists, and the many Mughal portrait albums that Nodi carted back to Delhi might have inspired his painters in Iran to create a single portrait of Nodi in their own visual language and technique. However powerful a body is, Unless it is cloaked in royal attributes, it remains the body of a mortal. Nor his body functions as the ultimate showcase for the exotic looted jewels, like the public exhibition he put on in a Herat of his war trophies, including the peacock throne, and the gift-laden embassies he sent to the Russian and Ottoman courts to announce his victory. The sparkling spoils can also be viewed literally and metaphorically 
as the luminosity of Nordic's divine glory or far. As Abu Allah Suleva writes, victories over non-Iranians generated the most potent of all fars. It could hardly be more potent than the far earned from defeating the richest empire in the world. Contemporary viewers would have been awestruck by this unprecedented um, display of jewels on the Shah's body. Persian painting up until now rarely showed the kings um, bedecked with jewelry. And this image heralded the gem encrusted bodies in Gojo paintings like Fatali Shah's. I also argue that um, Nodi was desirous of body markers that would project him as the universal sovereign for peoples of different cultures and religions in his expanding empire. Chief among these royal signs is the substitution of the turban with his crown-like hat and diadem. It's not just a break from the self of it past, but also to visually signal himself as King of Kings, Shah and Shah. A contemporaneous portrait of Nodi painted by Mughal court painter Muhammad Pannor declared itself as the, uh, the image of King of Kings, Jamshid like Nodi Shah. The new title is also inscribed on objects associated with his Indian victory, including a rupee coin, a ceremonial axe, and several priceless gemstones from the Mughal tre treasury. The prayer beads, being a symbol of piety in various religious um, traditions, represent Nodi to a multi-faith audience in his empire as the king of faith, Shah Hedin, an honorific that appears on a coin from his coronation. The beads are made more prominent, not, by, not just by his, its presence in several of his portraits, but by its virtual absence in prior depiction of Iranian rulers. Nodi's wish to establish a symbol of kingship that would be recognized across religious lines was fully aligned with his call for unity of um, Sunni and Shi'i Muslims at his coronation as well as the deliberately non-sectarian pronouncements on his coins and seals. In another oil portrait, now hung in the British Library, Nordi assumes a standing pose more typical of a European monarch. Significantly, this is the first Persian portrait depicting a Shah in a European three-quarter stance. Nordi's thrusting elbows, known as the Renaissance elbow, is a sign of masculinity that calls to mind um, portraits of um, Henry VIII. And it's of course also an established kingly pose in Persian painting. This blending of Persian and European royal postures is fitted in a painted oval, which was in vogue in Europe as a framing device for portrait, uh, portrait series of great men. We might consider this portrait in the context of the thriving culture of portrait collecting in 18th century Europe and how it might have been intended as a diplomatic gift perhaps to place Nordi in a ga gallery, um, gallery of illustrious kings. Little is known about its actual audience except that it was brought back from India by Henry Vansittart who entered the service of the East Indian Company in Madras in 1746 and rose to replace Robert Clive as the governor of Bengal. We know from, contemp from contemporary correspondence that one of um, several portraits of Nodi was presented to the British president of Madras in 1740, soon after the Delhi conquest. It is likely that the British Library portrait was a similar gesture. I should also say that the V&A portrait earlier was also brought back to the UK from India, and it too might have been a diplomatic gift as an alternative to my earlier suggestion of it being displayed in one of Nordi's palaces. Such a gift, as a British historian has suggested, might have served to keep Nordi at the forefront of the British authorities' calculations and reminded them of his political and military presence in the subcontinent. For someone whose legitimacy rested entirely on his achievements on the battlefield, equestrian imagery was essential to his identity. These images combined both Persian and European archetypes of the victorious warrior king on horseback. They evoke the Persian notion of chivalry, or Jafun Mahdi, um, and his parallel concept in early modern Europe. They also have in common a landscape setting, 
unlike paintings of individual equestrian figures in the Safavid period, which tend to be devoid of background. Here, I argue that the visual connection between the body of Nodi and the land of Iran underscores his self-image as the protector of Iran Zami. In the Shahnameyi Nodiri by Muhammad Ali Tusi, who accompanied Nodi on campaigns, Iran Zami is, depict, uh, is depicted as a Shahnameyi like land liberated by Nodi, akin to Faridun driving Zahog, a surrogate for the um, invading um, Arabs out of Iran Zami. According to Abu Zamanat, Tusi uses the term Iran Zami to denote a politically conceived entity whose prosperity and order are dependent on Nodi coming to the rescue. Indeed, the concept is explicitly proclaimed on a coin commemorating his coronation. It defines his identity as Nodi of Iran Zami and the conqueror of the world. When he's being whether he's being portrayed as a national savior or world conqueror, the self-centric nature of Nodi's image mirrors his highly personalized polity. With no hereditary lineage to boast, Nodi built a personal brand of authority around his own military genius and charisma. His self-reliance was widely noted as his obituary in a London paper reads, not being dependent on anyone but himself for the crown, he was resolved to manage it by his own will without any external help. The notion of the self as the sole source and symbol of power is expressed by his own chronicler, Miso Marikone Asterobodi, quote, the trenchant blade owes its excellence to his temper, not to the iron mine. After divine grace, his prevailment is by his own sword, end quote. This exclusive focus on the Shah's body would have been a novelty as, a sing as, uh, as single royal portraits were virtually absent in Safavid Iran. From the two century rule of the Safavids, we only um, have portraits of Abbas I and his beloved page here on the left in which Abbas's body is treated as a private object of his beloved's intimate gaze rather than a public spectacle of kingship. And there's also um, on the right, an Indianized portrait of Shah um, Suleiman uh, attributed to Sheikh Abbasi. But I found no other single portraits of Safavid Shahs painted in Iran during their lifetime. This is all the more perplexing considering single figure painting was experiencing phenomenal popularity in the 17th century and the most powerful members of the ruling elite, including several grand viziers are among those portrayed. This begs the question why the Shah is missing from the new genre. The persistent dearth of royal portraits amid such a flourishing period in portrait making stands as an art historical quandary. And the explanation I believe lies not in where the Shah is absent, but rather where he is present. Some of the Shahs are embedded in court, courtly gatherings and scenes of historical event. The most well-known are probably the audience scenes in the Chal Sutin Palace in Esfahan. By featuring the Shah of Shah at the apex of a repeated triangular arrangement, these paintings form a pictorial sersele of dynastic continuity as kingship migrates from Tamops um, to Abbas I and Abbas II in a self-perpetuating royal machinery. The anonymity of the support cast of courtiers and the unchanging visual hierarchy, contrary to evidence of actual changes in ceremonial protocols, create the impression of an eternal body politic that outlasts the lifespan of the Shah. According to Ernst um, Kantarowicz in his analysis of the doctrine of the king's two bodies, the body corporate is eternalized in two ways, horizontally as the plurality of persons collected in one person and vertically, as the plurality in succession. The Chahel Sutin group scenes combine both dimensions into an emphatic image of the immortal corporate body. These paintings, um, I argue, also promote the Golan and, and hegemony as the face of the Safavid uh, power structure, including front row grandees, beardless eunuchs, 
and young, uh, young Georgians wearing fur, fur brimmed hats. Seated in the highest and nearest place to the Shah, their physical closeness binds the elite slaves to the royal master into one corporate body. Such inseparability reflects the discourse of 13th century philosopher Nasser al dini Tusi on the body politic, in which he equates household slaves with their hands, feet, and eyes of the body. The Shah, acting as the head and soul of the body politic, must balance the different functionaries in order to maintain well, its well-being. And the triangular composition may serve as a visual metaphor for the power equilibrium between the Shah and his court. The physical proximity is also a pictorial articulation of the Shi'i ethos of sociability of the Shah, which was a mark of the Safavid charisma derived from the 12 uh, Imam. The Chahel Sutun scenes are the most monumental expressions of the Safavid body corporate, but they're by no means an isolated experiment. Group painting served as the predominant, if not exclusive mode of royal representation in the second half of the 17th, of the 17th century. Among them is a small series of court gatherings by Ali Gollier Jalbador in the St. Petersburg album, including these two. In my thesis, I argue that they may represent the most powerful members of the Ondarun or inner household and serve as a counterpoint to the grand vision of the Birun or outer court in the Chao Sujin paintings. In Safavid paintings, kingship is represented as a shared office with the Shah at his apex. This collective body has all but disappeared from Nadi's images. He is still depicted in the familiar Europeanized style of the late Safavid period and in the traditional seated and mounted posts, but with a stockier body type and his own royal attributes. This figure of the Shah, however, had been transplanted from the horizontal frame of the historicized painting to the vertical format of a single portrait. What was once a miniaturized figure within a pluralized entity is now single, monumental, and whole. The Safavid politic with the Shah as the head has thus been visually decapitated and dismembered, liberating the Shah's body to stage his one-man show. The breaking away of the king from the other courtly bodies echoes Nordi's strategy to purge the bureaucratic establishment. A soldier at heart and an outsider with no claim to dynastic legitimacy, Nordi harbored a suspicion of officialdom. The Gazelle Bosch roots of his Afshar clan may also have, may have added to his contempt for the Safavid model of centralized administration dominated by the Golan class. As Abbas Amonat has observed, Nordi's disgust for the machinery of government was evident in his consistent crushing of the old Safavid bureaucracy and haphazard replacement of it with, mili uh, with a military elite. The isolation of Nordi's body can also be viewed as divergence from the Shi ethos of sociability and accessibility practiced by Safavid shahs. Unlike the Safavids, Nordi's charisma was not dependent on staging uh, a show of hospitality. In fact, he is rarely, if ever, depicted in a feasting scene. Rather, Nordi's portraits emphasize his far earned from conquests, as well as the other, as well as other uh, warrior attributes such as Jaffa Mahdi I have discussed earlier. These immortal qualities reside in his individual capacity as Shah and together they grant dignity and sanctity to his office and confer eternal life on his body politic. Nodi is now the personification and so embodiment of kingship. The early portraits of Nodi served as prototypes for a long line of later iterations into the 19th century and beyond. In the interest of time, I have to leave these out of the talk, but I am happy to um, answer any questions later. And here's some more. My principal aim of this paper was to give you a sense of the novelty and longevity of Nodi's imagery and how it was reinvented from the Safavid mode of royal representation. But the visual legacy of Nodi goes far beyond his own images. His portraits promoted an aesthetic valorization of the Shah's body, 
and this new impulse of self-display led to the establishment of single portraiture as the principal mode of raw image making in the Zan and Gojo period. Abu Hassan Mustafi, Gafuri, Koshani, who painted a number of portraits of Karim Khani Zand, seems to have closely modeled these portraits of the Zand founder here on the right on Nordes. And in these seated portraits of Karim Khan and the first two Godot rulers, Aga Muhammad Khan and Fat Ali Shah, you can see the unmistakable DNA they share with the VNA portrait of Nodde. In her paper, Persian painting in the 18th century, tradition and transmission, Leila Dibor presents her important investigation into the familial and student teacher relationships of 18th century artists. Based on her work, I argue that the painters of Nordic portraits hailed from a lineage which may be biographical or stylistic, stretching back to the late Safavid royal workshop or extending forward to the Zand and Gojar periods, and in some cases, both. The web of connections enabled the painters to reformulate the Safavid past to create novel compositions and to carry their innovations in royal portraiture into the Zand and Gojar future. I have to dispel any lingering misperception that these later portraits sprang from European painting. They were homegrown creations that emerged from the works of Nordic image makers. They drew inspiration from sources as diverse as Iranian, Indian and European royal imagery to devise a competitive style befitting Nordic's world conquering um, rhetoric. Thank you. In scale, we're going to have to wind up very quickly now. I have four lines left, so the variety in scale from album page to life size and in the medium from oil uh, on canvas to watercolour on paper and ink drawing also speaks to an enthusiasm to search for the new. Ultimately, these painters created more than just portraits of Nordé. They envisioned a new body of the Shah, powerful, dominant, untethered from the court, a body that stands by itself as an exclusive site of ruling power. By doing so, they ushered in a modern vision of kingship as Iran faced into the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet, for another fascinating talk and wonderful PowerPoint. So now we will move. You'll take questions at the end. I won't uh, interrupt with the question now. And um, we'll move straight on to um, Kianush Motagedi. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Kianush Motaridi, and today I will be uh, I will be addressing you on a subject of from Chelsea to to Golestan Palace: the evolution of royal wall painting uh, during the reign of Fat Ali Shah. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, say thank you to the Sudavar Memorial Foundation and also to my colleague at the Idea of Iran Conference, Professor Charles Melby, Professor Sarah Stewart, for the invitation uh, for the invitation to present my article. And I'm honored to be a part of this session. I wish to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Leila Diba for her comments and valuable guidance, and also a special thanks to my friends and colleague, Dr. Negar Habibi. The Qajar period is one of the most astonishing periods of Iran's artistic history in the field of painting. I should change it. From a historical perspective, Iran underwent drastic changes in its cultural and socio-political environment during the Qajar period. However, the power of art patronage in directing artists and thus in shaping the history of art in Iran in the Qajar period cannot be overlooked. Wall painting was a prominent art form for displaying royal themes and monumental works in the 18th century. There were many murals in palaces and buildings of that period, which are now sadly mostly destroyed. However, some descriptions, pictures, or even a few restored buildings are available for observation and study. 
Qajar wall painting could actually be regarded as a transmission of a pre-existing tradition during the Safavid era, having manifested itself in hunting, feast, and battle scenes, notably at Chel Sutun Palace in Isfahan. Such a time-honored tradition continued into subsequent eras uh, in the Afsharid and Zan dynasties, with it taking a more narrative function for the impressive display of the ruler's authority shortly thereafter. While Zad art may be seen as a local school in Shiraz, Qajar art became national. In fact, the focus of post-Safavid paintings has gradually shifted to Qajar painting. This achievement was a consequence of Qajar political inclination. Before delving into main subject uh, of this lecture, I would like to mention some aspects of history of wall painting and its evolution up to 18th century. This topic has a long history dating back to the pre-Islamic period in Iran. The tradition of wall painting underwent a revival during the Islamic period from the Saljuk era onwards. An example of this could be seen in the murals of Sultan Mahmud Ghaznavi's palace in Lashkari Bazar. Thereafter, the decoration of Timurid and Safavid palaces and building provided an opportunity for the formation of new artistic genre through the beautification of the interiors of royal buildings and the houses of the elite. Isfahan, as the capital of the Safavid, undoubtedly created the opportunity for the development of wall painting tradition, which, has already, uh, which had already been established in Ghazvin. In this context, and as a result of the style of palace building developed by Shah Abbas in Isfahan, as well as his patronage of arts, the tradition of wall painting evolved dramatically. According to Susan Babayi, the location and themes of wall paintings at Chel Sutun Palace were governed by a deliberate scheme. In this scheme, the events documented the relations between the Safavid court and its eastern neighbors, royal feasts, and literary themes of romance. In this palace, wall painting constitute the most important part of the palace's decorative program. Thematically, the narrative paintings at the Chel Sutun Palace can be broadly divided into four categories. Prominent amongst these are historical scenes and the proto-royal of kings. The Safavid painter choose, chose a specific ceremonial format as a more effective visual means to deliver a political message. After the fall of Safavid in 1722, Shah Abbas's legendary statues were enhanced by virtue of comparison with what followed. For most of the rest of the 18th century, the lives of Iranian were blighted by chaos, war, and extortion. With the rise of Nader Shah, with the rise of actually the Afshari dynasty, its founder Nader Shah established his reign. This coincided with the Battle of Karnal in the late 1730s. Kalat Naderi was a fertile land in Khorasan where Nader built his utopia and monuments. Today, a record of the city and its building remains from the Nasser Din Shah's period, from which we can obtain detailed information on the buildings and gates of that period. According to historical records, most of the times Nader lived in camps or in Urdu, of which we have no more traces. Putting aside Kalat and Naderi, we should note that Nader was, not, was also not a great builder of palaces. The palaces he built in Kalat and Naderi have been entirely lost because they were made from wood. Hence, we cannot know how they were decorated. One of famous building in the Naderi period that we do have a trace of is its so-called Urchi Palace. Today, we have found some very few figurative wall paintings, the, the one that Janet shows, uh, but uh, most of the ornaments from that period are some vegetal motifs beside the bird and flowers, golomor or golobolbol, designed in Indian style that are painted on the walls of this palace. It should also be noted that some of these ornaments were added to the monument after Nadir Shah's reign. The only period of peace in 18th century Iran was during the reign of Karim Khan Zand in Shiraz. Karim Khan, who preferred the title regent Vakil to Shah, did not demand that his painters beautify his appearance even in monumental canvases. He was happy to show at the informal and unpretentious gathering in a modest architectural setting. 
the tone of most of the paintings that show Karim Khan, thus contrasts sharply with the later glorious images of Fat Ali Shah and his court. According to Basil Robinson, during uh, the, this period, Shiraz was the place for the formation of style that, that some 50 years later would progress under the reign of Fat Ali Shah. The best example of this in its early stages are probably the murals in Pars Museum and Haftanon Mansion. Most of the Zand buildings during the reign of Karim Khan were decorated with murals. In Pars Museum, we can see an oil painting of Karim Khan Zand audience hall. However, another version of its, um, pre, uh, another version of its preserved in Aga Khan Museum. And also recently I found another one inside Iran. It's preserved in the treasury of Niavaran complex, which is very, very interesting. It's exactly similar the, the one that you could see here. Uh, this monumental portrait of Karim Khan Zand and his kinsmen is an official image of a ruler. It looks decidedly less formal than the large single figure portraits of Fat Ali Shah from the early Rajar period. This is not the same concept as showing king or ruler in the splendor of his court. We can infer from the study of murals in the Zand era that the tradition of royal wall painting on plaster in which the king was portrayed in the middle position of the work that reappeared in a new form and function on the cotton wall paintings of Zan building in Shiraz. Interestingly, when the Rajar came to power, they deliberate sought to portray themselves as a revivers of the Safavid state and pre-Islamic dynasties because they knew how much this resonated with the Iranian people. Consequently, Agha Muhammad Khan appropriated both the monuments and the visual language of Safavid power. With the rise of the Qajar dynasty, Tehran was chosen as the new capital of Iran and fundamental changes occurred in its urban structure subsequent to which the construction of a number of buildings and monuments. A close examination of Qajar large scale paintings and monumental works for newly building palaces and some religious buildings demonstrates that they, that they were political in a sense and in their theme. Although Tehran was chosen as a capital of Iran during the reign of Ahu Muhammad Khan, he returned to his birthplace, Astarabad, to build his residential palace and audience hall. According to historical documents, murals in the Sari palaces with monumental theme were a collection of painting which took as their subject the battle and victories over the enemies by former kings, such as Shah Ismail Safavi and Nader Shah Afshar. This, this might remind us, uh, reminds us uh, what Asif Ashraf mentioned about the Rajar Kronlaka. The commission of such a paintings in a Rajar palace was nothing but the continuation of the wall painting tradition and the homage to traditional ornamentation by the Safavids palace, Safavids in palaces like Chel Sutun. Up to this date, we still cannot observe any murals of Agha Muhammad Khan portraits on the walls of Astarabad buildings. And what dominates is the depiction of Safavid and Afshari rulers. However, only two decades later, this tradition was continued with the patronage of Fat Ali Shah as the second Qajar monarch. The first manifestation of this was the wall painting by Abdullah Khan in Soleimaniye Palace in Karaj in 1812 to 1813. Portraying Agha Muhammad Khan beside his brothers and kinsmen in an idealized manner. Interestingly, in this painting, we can see the peacock throne, Takht e Tawus, on which the king is seated in the, the usual pose with the jewelry and a sword, but we know that this throne was built after Agha Muhammad Khan during the reign of Fat Ali Shah. Applying such an element could be considered an interesting innovation by court painter Abdullah Khan. Fat Ali Shah, Agha Muhammad Khan's nephew, the governor of Shiraz, came to, power, came to power after his uncle. This period could be regarded as the heyday of royal portraiture in the art history of Iran. When he began his rule, Fat Ali Shah viewed himself as the rightful heir uh, to, to the tradition of Persian king, uh, kingship rooted in the past. In contrast to Karim Khan, who modestly called himself Vakil or Ruaya, 
فتلیشا کالت ایمسف شوهنشا The King of the Kings Like Nader Evidence of both construction and iconography inspired by Iran's pre-Islamic heritage can be traced in the architecture and decoration uh, of the period of Fatali Shah's reign and gradually become a strong socio-cultural and artistic movement lasting until the end of Qajar period. Leila Diba comments that through the constant ordering and displaying of, this, of his portrait and his court in, this, in paintings, particularly in murals, Fatali Shah Qajar sought to consolidate his power and monarchy. Such a royal intention, intention has strongly manifested itself in various murals, some records of which could be traced from different sources in palaces such as Negaristan Palace, Khurshid Mansion, Eshrat Ayn Palace, and also Soleimani Palace in Karaj. Fatali Shah's most impressive achievement in his early years of kingship was probably the creation of balance between two ideas, ancestral theme and the support of Shia ideology. This made it possible for him to gain the approval of religious authorities, ulama, by restoring and constructing religious buildings, as well as continuing his ambitious project in building glorious royal palaces in the form of terrestrial paradises. All this, all this would result in the development of wall painting as well as rock reliefs. In royal residence, paintings functioned as a unit of a rich array of decorative programs. Battle and hunting scenes stood amongst the common theme in the wall paintings of the royal residence. The present example that you can see here uh, displays a portrait of the young equestrian Shah Fatali Shah in Ganja conquest Azerbaijan as a victorious king. This painting was once located on the wall of the Tanabi Palace in Golestan. If we are to present a categorization of the royal portraits and monumental themes during the period of Fat Ali Shah, we can list under three groups. Uh, the first is the single image of the uh, like portrait of seated ruler on the throne. The second shows the ruler in hunting and battle scene. And the third group would be in tournament scene de dedicated to a special innovation theme called Salam ceremony or royal reception. The latter was pioneered by chief painter Nagoshboshi Abdullah Khan and was considered a symbol of power and legitimacy of the Rajars for about three decades. Such a theme and composition in painting was considered a prototype for other painters of the time and manifested itself in other art media as well. As we know, the idea of portraying royal receptions and royal entournment with courtries and distinguished guests standing humbly in rows dates back to the ancient times. Such a theme can be seen in Achaemenid, Parthian, and Sasanid reliefs in which the king is located in the center of the world, looking at the viewers whilst courtries and servants flank him. Such a time-honored tradition continued right into the Islamic period in art media such as illustrated manuscript and stucco carving. An example of ladder can be seen as in, in a stock work, stock work relief in Seljuk ruler Togrol, discovered in Ray and now which is preserved in the Museum of Philadelphia. It may be fitting before uh, describing the Salam ceremony from rural residents of Rome to briefly define the style of this monumental wall painting within its generally history. The direct supervision of the Shah, means Fatali Shah, over the painters shows his awareness of the importance of this subject. At the beginning of Fat Ali Shah's reign, Abdullah Khan resumed his career as a chief court painter. And when he was young, he was given the commission to carry out a monumental wall painting of the ruler and his court for the Negaristan Palace in Tehran, as you could see. Abdullah Khan was probably born between 1781 to 1786, late Zan period. Uh, he started his career as a young artist in a co uh, concursion uh, with the reign of Agha Muhammad Khan, but flourished during Fat Ali Shah's period. The considerable evidence for the artistic contribution of Abdullah Khan over the six decades had previously led to an investigation of his role in the establishment and development of the royal wall painting Safe Salam 
in the 19th century. The formation of such a new theme in the art of that period, and in particular in the murals of the palaces, was mostly for the purpose of representing the power and legitimacy of Qajar. This life-size wall painting was prepared for the reception hall of the Negaristan Palace by Abdullah Khan in 1812 to 1813. Some experts, however, have suggested that this work is of an imaginary New Year reception. The innovation of his style appeared once more in Soleimaniye Palace in Karaj. In this palace, he executed two large wall paintings, including Fatali Shah and his sons, as well as Agha Muhammad Khan and the leaders of, leaders of the Ghajar tribes on the facing wall. You could see a picture of Fatali Shah in the Soleimani on top. Fatali Shah had very firm beliefs about religious issues. He would make a several pilgrimages to the holy shrines of Shia Imams, the religious statues of home city as the tomb of Hazrat Masume, Imam Reza's sister, was immense at the time that Fatali Shah would go there when he was traveling to the other central cities in Iran. In 1808, he ordered the construction of the residential building and a great palace near the shrine. He would reside there uh, in his visits to Rome. This palace was called Emarat Divani, uh, it means governmental mansion. According to Henri Dalmani, traveler uh, Shah restore, restored this holy place in 1810, and he also added a guest house and hospital constructed next to the shrine. For his last years of rulership, Fatali Shah appointed his 28th son, Kekavus Mirza, to the governorship of Qom in 1832. Kekavus Mirza constructed a royal audience hall and ordered for it a large wall painting with the theme of a royal reception in recognition of his father. The painting that you're looking at, uh, was completed during the last two years of Shah's life. There were 150 figures in the painting who were the Shah's sons and grandchildren. Unfortunately, this palace was abandoned after Fatali Shah's death and was, an, uh, uh, was on the verge of destruction during the reign of the subsequent ruler, Muhammad Shah. Dedicates later, during the reign of Nasruddin Shah, the building underwent partial restoration. According to Etezado Dole, the restoration began in 1879 and continued until 1884. In his diary, Nasruddin Shah recorded some interesting accounts of this building and its wall painting, the last of which dated back to 1887. Furthermore, other Qajar dignitaries such as Etemado Saltane in 1884 and Faridul Mulk Hamedani in 1906 have also provided accounts of this mural, uh, this monumental work. The building and its halls were destroyed by the order of Ayatollah Burujirdi in 1954 for the aim of renovation and expansion, and a mosque was replaced. Fortunately, before destruction, some experts tasked themselves with detaching the paintings from the wall and transferring it to another location. The detached painting was carried to Tehran in 54 plaster block, blocks. The pieces were preserved for some time in Treasury of Parliament of Iran, Majlis e Baharistan, and in 2005, they were transferred to the Treasury of Golestan Palace. Finally, in 2015, the murals was brought out after 60 years of storage, and the pieces were relocated on the walls of Negaristan Palace Museum in 2017, uh, following two years of restoration. The wall painting of the Royal Mansion in Qom is a masterpiece and could be regarded as a coincidence of, the, of all former achievements in paintings during Fatali Shah's reign. The paint, this painting, like its other predecessors, once again depicts Fatali Shah in a seated position on the peacock throne, Takht Tawus, exactly like, it, like the works of other leading court painters, such as Mehrali and Mirza Baba. The figure of the Shah in the center is flanked by his elder sons in order of hierarchy. The first figure on the left uh, is the crown prince Abbas Mirza, who passed away a couple of months after the completion of this painting. The last years of Fatali Shah's reign brought about a period of hardship and conflicts for the Qajar government. 
this crisis was due to the difficult situation provoked by internal and external tensions. Abbas Mirza's heavy defeated by Russian in addition to other hardship resulted in poor condition for the country, especially in its central and eastern parts. Under such unfavorable circumstances, the act of creating a great work of art was nothing but an attempt to showing and strengthen family ties as well as maintain the legitimacy of the Qajars. If we take a look at the calm face of the Shah and the glory of his court, we can recognize the image of power embodied here. But who would be the painter of such a masterpiece? Um, the actual size of this painting was far greater than what we can observe today. In stylistic terms, it's, it, it is hieratic, extremely, extremely lavish and commensurate. In the original work, there were 150 figures, but today we can only see 99. The artist's signature was to be, be inscribed underneath the work, but unfortunately there is no trace of it now. We cannot even find any trace of its painter in the documents available. In my opinion, the present wall painting in terms of style and composition is fairly similar to two other murals in Negaristan and Soleimani palaces. Incidentally, the present, the, the present painting share close affinities and its composition, the figure poses and other elements in the scene to the rock relief in Shahre, which is known as a Naqsh Khagan, the portrait of the Shah. You could see in comparison these two together. This is from Shahre on the top, on the bottom. Uh, interestingly, this rock relief was completed in 1832 to 1833. According to the to accounts and documents, uh, the relief in Shahre was done under the supervision of Abdullah Khan and he actually should be considered the artist who initiate a new theme in painting called Royal Reception. As a collective result, we can attribute the wall painting from Qom to Abdullah Khan because at the same time in 1832 and 1833, he was working on two parallel projects in which he used the same methods and style to compose a royal set, scene. Moreover, in 1833, Abdullah Khan was committed by Fatali Shah to design his tombstone for the Qom Shrine, which can also be proved that he may have stayed in that re region for a while. Thank you for your attention. Kianush, thank you so much for a wonderful talk, a really colorful, beautiful PowerPoint, and also for finishing on the dot of um, four o'clock. So we now have questions for everybody and I'm going to go right into those because there are a lot. Um, it would, I think, be good to try and, and more or less allocate 10 minutes to each speaker. I'm going to go in chronology because the questions are fairly straightforward and they go to in that order. So starting um, with Ernest Tucker, I thought perhaps you could take um, two together, and those two came from um, Susan uh, Barbayi and Anthony Wynn. Um, let me just find them. Ah, oh, I think for some reason the, my first lot of questions seem to have um, disappeared. Ernest, do you have those questions? Let me take a look. Let's see. I think I definitely had Susan Barbayi, unless you answered it or uh, by yeah, in writing. I did. I did write her. So. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so Anthony Wynn was roughly. You may have answered him as well because that was more or less on the same. Um, it was talking topic. about cities, I suppose. That's right. That's yeah. right. Well, I guess my quick my quick answer to that is I think you know not her, like all the great nomadic. Uh, uh, sovereigns and monarchs had this mobile uh, capital that went with him. I mean, this is uh, something that even the Safavids had, of course, too. I think the, the problem was he really never had enough time to put a city together. My, my theory is it might have been Mashhad had he had another 10 years or something. Um, and of course, Kalat itself 
had the makings of a of a city complex too. So I think maybe it just was a factor of you know time. He didn't have enough time. Maybe that's just a theory. But it's a, it's interesting to think he's not. Normally, you have sort of a city to display your nomadic uh, amazement, and you come back to it now and again. Mostly, you're in a camp, you know. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway. Great. Well, thank you. And then there was um, there were another two on um, looking back to the Safavid period um, from Laura, um, Zuccaro and Masud. Uh, and um, they, one, Laura's was about nostalgia um, with the Safavid empire and what um, caused the change. So basically, how long did the Ottoman fascination nostalgia? Oh, the, the, the Ottoman art? piece. Yeah, I yes. think the Ottomans kept it going as long as they could. I think they kind of, they, the, the, there was an attempt to kind of keep it going. Uh, I've written an article about this too in the Afshar successors to Nader. They tried hard with that. That didn't quite work. Then they tried a kind of final uh, gasp of this with uh, uh, Ahmed Shah Durrani who was sort of the pseudo ruler of Northern Iran with Shah Rukh as his vassal in a way. But um, I think that, yeah, and I think that after that, and certainly by the Qajar period, they had, they had things were, were uh, sort of anew. But this goes to the point of Nader changing the equation a little bit. And I think that Janet's and Kinnish both uh, show the artistic version of this, that he changed the imagery and he changed the, the way things were thinking. And I think the, the Ottomans had to change in that regard too. So that's how I would answer that. It's a great question. Yeah, thank you. And then, and then um, uh, this is slightly different um, approach, but this is from Masood. What are your thoughts about the role and influence of religion in Nada's idea of Iran in relation to the Safavids? So, oh, yeah. it's, it, it's very important. It's back to the thing as I was mentioning about this Mashab Jafari and the whole discussion about that. And I would, Again, I, I don't mean to be disingenuous, but I could turn him to my book about that. So, uh, okay. yeah, and I think that it's a very, very important piece of the puzzle. A absolutely, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering what, who you've written back to um, in answer to the questions. But there was also, um, I know that uh, Charles had an observation he wanted to make in response Indeed. to your talk. So Charles, perhaps you'd like to um, ask. Oh, uh, thank you. Well, if there's time, it was really partly linking up what uh, Ernie was talking about with something in um, Asif Ashraf's paper at the beginning of the day. And I, I, I mean, of course, we all know that uh, uh, Kazim Marvi started off, uh, um, you know, pro Nadia and ended up against him. It's quite an interesting right. development. And I, I just thought it'd be interesting to sort of link that with what we were talking about with um, Asif, if any of the, you know, how the chroniclers may have started off being in favor of the Qajars and then mm -hmm. you know, beginning to see the warts. Uh, and it, it's really just an observation linking up the two panels in a way, because- Right, uh, comparative uh, historiographical trajectory, you know. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, it, it's interesting, you know, the, the start may be all fantastic, all this legitimacy and here we go. And then, you know, suddenly things go wrong and it doesn't look quite so good. I, I just wonder if this is going to crop up in the in the later Qajar historiography as well, which I, I'm not totally yeah. familiar with. Well, I think it's also, and Janet points this out in some of the pictures that she presented, these wonderful pictures of, of Nader much later on, like this this Parsi Indian version of Nader. Yeah, I love that. that. Fantastic. Fantastic yeah. picture. <laughs> but, but you know, the point is there's a nostalgia then for Nader, weirdly enough, is yes. the point. You know, it's a succession. So I think that's a really interesting comparative nostalgia and comparative disillusionment, you know. Yes. You know. Well, that was right. all. Thanks, thanks very much. Thank you. The paper's all hung together beautifully, actually. Yeah. <laughs> there, there, is another, um, there is another question um, from Ali. Um, Abdel Rezaei for, for Ernest um, about self-definition and view of the other and how did Persia and specifically Nadi himself view Europe at the time um, mm. and the question goes on given the fact that he tried to build a navy and using some western engineers occasionally can we assume that on some level um, uh, he given the Western political, scientific and technological advances, he tried to appreciate 
Western or European achievements? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And it's something that I'm really sort of working on at the moment. And it's it's clear, for example, the most clear evidence of that, I think, is on the Caspian, where he really tries to, you know, he has obviously this naval project in the, in the Persian Gulf that he puts, he, he tries to get the Dutch and the British to kind of, <laughs> kind of give, and he of course goes to Bombay and has ships made in Bombay as well. So I think absolutely he, he was tapping into this naval expertise of the, of the Gulf. He himself had this idea of taking these wonderful forests of Mozandaran and making this navy in the Caspian and somehow getting those, those wonderful timbers to the Persian Gulf. So I think absolutely he had a lot of these plans. You know, he had a lot of interest. And I think his window into this, his kind of partners in crime were the Russians in a way. And I think this is where the, the Caspian link is so important, the Astrakhan link and the, and the, the link with the Russians and all of the, of the technology there. So it's, it's, a, it's absolutely a, a critical part of him, of his discussion. So yeah, absolutely. But, but it's something I, I'm, I'm working on. So <laughs> more to follow, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thank you. I think we might move on then to the questions for Janet. And if Great. there are any more that come in, we, we can obviously fit these at, them in at the end of this time. Um, so Janet, again, thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, lots of questions and some have come in on the Facebook feed as well. So I thought perhaps we could start with, there are three, mm -hmm. I'm just going to say the surnames because you can find them more easily. Salo, Frederick and Mehreen. Mm -hmm. um, so these are questions loosely um, related to each other, I would say. Um, well, this, the first one from Salor actually is to do with the name of the poet of the lines quoted in the first slide, the Reza Shah slide, but that's, that's a, a separate issue. The second question relates to the others and it's to what extent can we claim that the new portrait of Nada and the new body politic was under the influence of Western portraits. Mm -hmm. So that relates to your um, image of Henry, Henry VIII. Mm -hmm. um, and then we go on to Masood, I've lost, but Mehreen, um, you mentioned the, asks, you mentioned the jewelry worn by Nadir Shah in 1740 portraits representing his conquering of the Mughals. Can we also see this in the new types of imperial portraiture that you discuss, the single image of the ruler in the equestrian portrait, which were already established imagery associated with royal Mughal portraits. So this goes obviously to the Mughals. Um, and then, yeah, you may, you may have answered the question um, from Frederick, because that also related back to, yes, yeah, sorry, influence of European portrait posture and style. With the, the, yeah. The first question about the poet, I mean, because that's just a, that's, that's, that's a quick one. Yeah. Um, the, the poster or the print gives the name of um, Agomizo Habib Allah Khan from Shiraz, but I don't know whether he was responsible for designing the, 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 the image or whether he actually also wrote um, uh, uh, the verses as well. Um, it, it didn't really say. Um, um, so that's kind of all I could glean from um, from 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 the image itself. Um, but I'm happy to, if um, there's some way we can get the email, I'm happy to send on the link of um, the website that has that image, um, if that's any help. Thank you. In terms of, you know, uh, I think I have dealt with, you know, briefly uh, uh, elements or inspirations from Europe or Mughal India. Uh, certainly they are uh, uh, very present and it's it's no um i suppose you know anyone familiar with person painting know that um going back in south of it the, the european nice style the the farangi saucy it, you know it's been there for quite a while so um obviously painters have been looking at european and um, prints and, and paintings and imagery um, and not to i mean i i'm very um i think try to resist any temptation to just simply say Oh, you know, that's European influence or Mughal influence, and that's kind of appropriate from this and that. It's never quite like that. They they kind of selected elements that, that would suit whatever purpose that they 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 um, they're working on. 
and um, as you can see from even the self of it painting, uh, Europeanized paintings. But um, I mean, in my thesis, of course, we can't really get into this. There are very specific, the equestrian imagery, some of them, they are very um, almost direct connection to certain images in the West, that's for sure. Um, but again, you know, I would argue that, you know, it's taking certain elements and making it their own, using their own style, using their own technique. Um, and likewise, for the uh, Mughal Indian side, I have explained or, or mentioned various elements that I felt would have contributed to um, Nordic images. Um, but, um, and, 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 you know, uh, the, the, and the, the, idea of this um, sort of hybrid Indo-Persian aesthetic that actually um, uh, Suzanne uh, uh, talked about in, in her paper of the Kalat, the pavilion. Um, and, and, and also um, earlier we saw that in the slide, in the building, the Indian stone carving and the, this sort of hybrid um, aesthetic. You can see that in the, across the full corpus of, of the images of Nore. Um, so, you know, that it's quite clear and, and to point out that all his paintings, whether single portraits or group ones, they were all painted, as far as I can see, after the Delhi conquest. So obviously the India uh, uh, victory, the Indian victory was a pivotal moment. Um, so the connection with India, it's clear. Um, but again, you know, in India, they didn't have um, oil painting. Um, that came from, you can say it came from Europe, but it was already established in the late Slavonic period. We have large, I think, uh, um, and Leila Du Bois written about it, and and, and Eleanor Sims had also written about it. And um, these large um, oil paintings, um, and from the late Slavonic period, it's just the main change is you know getting those oil portraits to depict kings as well as you know the the other um, elite members of the Slavonic court, um, and 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 of other um, um, parts of Esfahan. So I think that would be my answer to, you know, different inspirations, whether it's coming from Europe or Mughal India. Good, well, thank you. Uh, of course, the, all the Parsi um, portraiture comes very directly from Europe, so well, much, much later, but it's, it's interesting to know where the other, you know, where the earlier um, influences have come from. Um, there's a question from um, Lindsay Allen um which i think we can That's answer with the hermitage um, portrait and the yes and the horse gate yeah. in the background i did actually look at that because the painting is dated and the date it's um it it's it sort of aligned with the very end of a three-year campaign of not Shah in um dagestan and, and and that area is notorious for the really tough terrain and a, that could be part of the reason why ultimately he didn't, he, 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 you know, that campaign failed. And it was sort of like a status quo um, uh, uh, at the end um, of the three year campaign. Um, so that could be one, I mean, uh, we're never going to know, but that, that, that's one of my guesses. And the other one, it, it, it could be, and you know, people can tell me, uh, you know, that it's wrong. It, it could be um, maybe referencing where he was actually from, um, which is a very mountainous area as well. Um, you know, near Kalat or, you know, um, so, so that, that, that would be my other guess. Um, but of course, I don't, I don't really know. And the inscription, um, it, it doesn't, uh, that doesn't give you any clue. Okay, thank you. Um, now we have two questions that have come in from Hyun Jin Cho. Uh, they're both quite long. Um, so he'd like to know a bit more about um, the art, the, what happened to Nader Shah's images in the 19th century, the afterlife, as he puts it, particularly the context of the album of paintings and calligraphy, um, the one with the painting signed by Muhammad Sadi, and the landscape backgrounds of both the portraits he finds fascinating. Um, and then the second part of his question is, um, about the about your study of the portraits of Nader Shah, and could you say a little bit more about representation of Nader Shah in manuscript painting compositions? Um, so that's another. Uh, yeah, um, those are. I mean, I I I, I could really sit here and I, I love to talk about all those, but those are quite lengthy discussions, I'm afraid. 
Um, and, and some of them, you know, I, I, I hate, I, I couldn't talk about some of this 19th century paintings. The one, one of those, it's a fascinating painting, which is a frontispiece in the British Library um, of Nolly's portrait. And, and his four pointed hat was morphed into the Gojo black cat. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's fascinating how his image was being taken and, and used for various um, uh, uh, purposes and, and agendas. And that particular um, manuscript, um, fascinating, but of course I can't really get into all of that. Um, and likewise, and manuscript paintings, yes, um, I only addressed um, single portraits in this talk. But of course, there are also um, group scenes in which, unlike the Safavids, he's not with a full court, a, he's tends to be with his sons. Um, so sort of the, the, the family body politic out court. And then um, there are, of course, uh, uh, illustrations to manuscripts of, the, there are a few of them, of the Torihi uh, Noderi. So I, um, I talked about that previously in another talk. And, um, and of course, um, there are dozens of his portraits from um, India. And I've recently given a talk about that as well. Um, uh, and, but it's, it's, um, it's, you know, they are sort of, you know, I can get another three or four talks out of them. So I don't think it's very unfair for the other speakers for me to talk about them, um, you know, but I'm happy to um, discuss, you know, if I can get the contact detail of the person that I'm happy to talk about um, more with that person. Okay, well, there may be time to, to return to that. Uh, I perhaps now we'll um, uh, move on to questions addressed to um, Kianush Matagidi. Um, there's the first one from Susan Barbayi. I'm just looking. Yeah, there's just one. Um, and also inviting comments from the others on the his historiographic um, historiographic tendency to attribute Kaja self-representation either to European sources, which you've asked um, the audience to moderate, or to the pre-Islamic sources. Nada is clearly an important transitional phase, uh, she says. So do, and others perhaps would like to um, contribute to that answer as well after you. Can you? Did you hear? Did you hear me for that question from Susan Baboyi? Seem we seem to have lost you. you. Are you muted by any chance? Looks like he's frozen. Janet, uh, sorry. sorry. Did you hear? My, did you hear the question? Oh, for me, I, I thought it was. Um, sorry, I, I thought it was. So, I'm so sorry. It is. It is for Kianush. Sorry, it's for Kianush Matagati. Yes, oh, and then that. and then <laughs> Suzanne has invited others to come in. But Kianush, you're muted, so you need to unmute yourself. Or Aki, could you unmute Kianush, please? Uh, I think uh, Kianush has lost connection, so we'll have oh, to okay. Pass it for now. Yep. Okay. I don't know if anyone else has any would have any comments on that question because the rest of the questions ah oh, he's back again. Kianush, can you hear us? Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I have some problem with the pure connection here. <laughs> so I, I asked a question addressed to you by Susan Barbayi, whether you could um uh, comment on the historiographic tendency um, to attribute Kaja self-representation to either European sources, which Janet asked uh, us to moderate, or the pre-Islamic sources. And she adds, Nada is clearly an important transitional phase. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Susan Baboyi. Uh, of course, I, I believe that uh, most of the, I mean, Qajar painting, the mural one, at the beginning of Fat Ali Shah era, inspired by the pre-Islamic one, because as you know, when Fat Ali Shah was young, he was a governor of the Shiraz, and he had this opportunity to, to visit those, uh, those reliefs from Sasanid and Akamanid, over there, I mean, all around the Shiraz and Fars province. So uh, the artists who had been working with him, who were working for his atelier also had this uh, knowledge of the, the composition of the, uh, um, 
those rock reliefs. And I showed you a picture that you could see exactly painter like me. Rally start to copy the motives, copy the, the appearance, the manner of the sitting on the chair. And I think uh, this this uh, ancestral team is much more in, I mean, influenced on this uh, kind of painting. But of course, after a while, mostly at the end of Fatali Shah's reign, uh, we had a more connection with Russia and also other countries. And it's possible to see this, uh, which, which as a result, you could see this uh, European, European style of painting um, um, is, is um, it flourished at the end of uh, Fatali Shah, mostly in Muhammad Shah and Nasser Din Shah is completely, uh, completely changed the, the, the characteristics of the uh, Iranian painting mostly. I'm talking about the murals, figurative murals. Uh, but of course, you could see the similarity with the manuscripts. Um, uh, exactly the same things happened for the Nader Shah that Janet uh, mentioned. As you could see, we couldn't find a very, I mean, num too many number of the uh, murals uh, from Nader Shah, but we have some manuscripts, which uh, is always connected with India. And I could add this to the Janet that um, according to my uh, research, I understand that uh, I, I found some evidence of uh, in Kalatan Nadari, partly built by Indian um, architect and also painters. So I think uh, at the beginning of the Fatali Shah, we are more attached to the pre-Islamic thing. That's why we have some reliefs. Uh, remember that we don't have uh, relief and rock relief for more than uh, 1,000 years. And Fatali Shah is a person who sponsored and understand the, the value of the uh, rock relief to, to show himself in the um, luxurious way and uh, it, it still remain for us. Well, thank you. Well, on, on the subject of your rock reliefs, there's a, there's a question from Kevin Gledhill. Um, do the rock reliefs and wall paintings show significant differences in genre and theme or, or simply in medium? Uh, actually, we had a very similar uh, parallel way between the murals and rock reliefs. Most of the times, uh, these, these rock reliefs, which we know uh, from the Fatali Shazarat, we still have eight one. Uh, some of them are all around Tehran as a capital at that time, uh, designed by the person, Abdullah Khan, which I mentioned, the, the court painter, the chief court painter, designed the uh, rock leaf and also he paint for the murals. So in this case, you could see the similarity between these two concepts. And as I result for this, my, my lecture, I understand that we could also attribute the Tequom uh, mural, which recently found, it's somehow it's attributed to Abdullah because at the same time, the mural in Rome and rock relief in Shahre, uh, it was in progress at the same time. So yes, I mean, both murals and uh, rock reliefs are affected and always were, uh, has gone with the, in parallel way. Um, thank you. There's a question for you from um, Firuza, Firuza Melville, um, thanking all, all of the panel for beautiful talks. And this is for you, Kianush. Um, she says, I assume there are no Khosrow and Jahangir among the princes in the Nagaristan panels. That's her question. Are there or are there are, that she's assuming there are no um, Khosrow and Jahangir? Um, in, 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 in the Nagaristan mural or yeah. in Rome mural? In the, she says in the Nagaristan panels. Um, actually, we have some uh, photos uh, remain from, uh, as you know, uh, the, the the garden and the part of these buildings in Nagaristan demolished uh, many years ago. And we just have some pictures, which is the only source that I, we could uh, study that mural. But in the Qom, in the, this new mural that I present, we have these two also. And uh, remember that the mural in Rome, uh, the number of the um, princes in the mural in Rome in the original painting was 150. And uh, definitely all these children, uh, and you, you know the Patelisha has lots of children, uh, all of these children 
children and uh, grandchildren was in home. But in the uh, Negaristan, I have to check again because we have some pictures. We don't have a complete picture. We have some copy, which uh, uh, we have some watercolor copy uh, from that, and we could check on that also. It would be helpful. Good. Um, there was an, oh, well, this is another one from Firuza, but this is actually for Janet, mm -hmm. um, what, asking what the attitude to Nadi Shah in it was or is in modern India. So, um, because the first slide um, showed some sort of cover of, of, of an Indian children's book. Um, with Nadia on the cover. So perhaps, um, Janet, you, that's addressed to you. Yeah, I, I looked at um, this question um, when I was doing a talk recently on um, Nadia's Indian portraits. And I was looking around, um, I suppose I was looking at contemporary time and also into the 19th century. and. Depends on who you're looking at, because I was wondering how come that there's so many Indian portraits of Nadi being portrayed as the Pasha, even though you know, with all the brutality, all the killings and everything. Um, and I think you know, it, the, the certainly even local historians at the time they weren't particularly sympathetic towards Muhammad Shah, and they saw him as um, someone who just um, was inept in what he was trying to, uh, in, uh, and actually um, abdicating his responsibility uh, uh, over his people. And, um, but then there are also lots of people that um, uh, um, the local leaders in the regions, they were already, um, even before Nodi came on the scene, they were already uh, 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 rebelling. And actually to the point where um, uh, it's kind of widely accepted that a couple of them, um, they, they were actually, they actually incited Nodi to come and, 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 um, and, and come to Delhi and, and, and take down Mohan Shah. So, so that was the sort of environment that you're looking at. Um, so, and I think from there, you know, one, one can work on um, um, why was Nodi Shah um, being included in some of these series of Mughal rulers. Um, in in the form of a Mughal emperor himself. Um, and also, of course, there's another uh, side of the equation. A lot of these Indian portraits were also found um, in British um, uh, 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 collections. Um, and of course, I also talked about the, the British colonial agenda in that, in that um, you know, to try to get my head around what was going on. Um, but, you know, so, but going back to, um, to you know, what, what did, um, I don't know about modern day Indian, what did they think of Nadi Shah? Um, you know, I think they would look back and say that that's a traumatic period. And there's actually also, uh, there's the, uh, a Bollywood movie about him. There was also a, a musical. Um, the musical actually is quite funny. It's, um, oh, I didn't watch it, but I saw the, the, the abstract about it, that it's actually, they just um, pretended that the local people, they, uh, there was an uprising and they managed to chase Nadi Shah out of India. So, you know, there's a mix of, I think, um, emotions and feelings about it. And um, so that's, that's all I, I, could, I, I had gleaned from, from what I heard. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I think we might just, we've got two minutes, try, it's, again, it's for you, um, Janet, a quick uh, answer if you can, um, but it's come off the Facebook stream. So it's, um, what is the reason connecting the muscular figure of Nader Shah to the Javan Mahdi? Is it a moral concept or is there any document indicating um, Nader's relationship with Javan Mahdi or any text that describes him as such? I mean, like a lot of things, there are no documents to say, you know, Nader was into this concept or that concept. I think, um, you know, a lot of it is you're trying to, to think of um, you know the, the the political environment and conditions at the time, but the idea of of Java Mali, I read. I mean, I, I don't profess that I'm um, knowledgeable in it, but from what I read, it includes both physical and moral traits of um, of the idealized warrior. Um, so, um, and, and I have um, you know uh, written quite a bit about that in, in in my thesis. So it isn't just the moral or just the physical, but certainly there are physical elements in it, um, which I, I you know I, I kind of try to associate. I think there's a recent book that was published is an edited volume um, on Java Madi, and I think you know in the opening say it's one of these really fluid concepts that 
no one can come up with a definitive, you know, meaning to what it is. But you know, from uh, certainly, you know, I, from what I, I could see, that there are uh, there's a strong physical element actually connected and actually stemmed from the 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 the, um, the military side of of the the idea of the man. So. Good. Well, thank you. Well, I have omitted. Um, all the uh, all the thank yous and the compliments that have also flowed in with the questions. I rather tended to um, focus on the questions and thank you very much, all of you, for for your answers and engaging with everybody and for fabulous talks. So now um, I will say goodbye and we'll have a break for half an hour. Very good. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Right.